Hey everybody, Frank Cox here. I'm excited. It's happy hour. Uh, I happen to be uh, in San Antonio right now in my hotel room, um, but I am well equipped. I got some Shinerbach with me. As whenever you're in Texas, you got to do what they do, you know, Sh Shinerbach and Lone Star. That's what it's been the whole time. Um, not sure what else we're going to have, but I can tell you this we got a cool cat on the show with us tonight. His name is Dustin Dixon. And uh, for those of you guys that don't hang out on the Instagrams or may not ever heard of him, he builds some freaking cool stuff. Um, he's a career welder and uh, does a lot of pit building, some trailer building, and he builds some cool kitchen gadgets too. We're going to kind of talk to him about vintage uh, pits and stuff, pit design for just because I've seen some pits he does with these white wall tires and stuff, and they just look super cool. And uh, I'm excited for this one tonight. But uh, hey, real quick, hang in there, and we're going to be right back. What's up, Dustin? What's going on, Frank? How you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. I've, I've been in this hotel room, uh, well, the hotel all day today, so it's been a pretty easy day. I wasn't out in the shop. Um but uh, guys, this is Dustin, and uh, like I say, his uh, handle there is at Mule Skinner Smoke Rigs. Tell us a little bit about Mule Skinner Smoke Rigs, there, Dustin. Uh, pretty fresh to the uh, smoker game. Uh, we started a page back last May, I believe. Uh, we're based out of Bristol, Texas, here, just east of Ennis. We're about thirty minutes south of Dallas, and uh, mm -hmm. just intending to uh, get some smokers out to the masses. Yeah, that's cool. So. Uh, I know that you, uh, you build smokers and stuff like that. Um, uh, but tell us about some of the other, the other cool stuff and then what your favorite styles of smokers is. Okay. Yeah. We build, uh, we build burger presses. We build, uh, attachments for, uh, onions to go on a grill cleaner or season the grill with, uh, we sell planches. Mm -hmm. We sell uh, live fire tables that roll around for your backyard or, or even a commercial restaurant. Um, yeah. But our, our burger presses have been pretty big here lately. Uh, we've got a lot of people that want them. Um, got a friend of mine up in uh, up in Wiley that uh, really pushes them for us. His name's uh, Josh Hunt, and um, mm -hmm. he uh, he's got forty something thousand followers on Instagram. So he he loves our product and pushes it. And we have sold lots of burger presses, but um, we've also got um, wood racks and all different types of things on our website. Yeah, just all the fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how long have you been around? Where are you now? And then how long have you been around there? Uh, where I'm at here currently? Yeah, I think you said Enos, Texas. Yeah, down and, here, there. yeah. yeah Bristol. Uh, we, this is my fifth address to live on since I was born. I've lived out of this town for about a year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, Life longer. So, yeah. So recently, I believe you did a collaboration with Millscale on a pit. Tell us about I that. Did. I did. That was really um, cool. Yeah, John bought that uh, from. Um, oh, I've lost his name. Up, at, I think he's at Dozier's down in Houston, uh, Buchanan. Mm -hmm. uh, he had that pit, and uh, John from Interstellar bought that. And I think the word is Millskill didn't have time to get him a trailer built, so John reached out. I saw him at an event at uh, Matt Leon's uh, Smoke Game Strong events. And uh, asked mm -hmm. if I wanted to build a trailer, so we all just kind of jumped in together. And and Brady over at Brisket Country put us some cool graphics to put on the uh, tongue of it, and went from there. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, I love it. I love seeing uh, you know notable pit builders, you know, throwing down together on uh, yeah. on builds and stuff like that. Well, um, guys, just so you know, as you as we're going here, pop comments and questions and things in the chat there. If you've got a question for Dustin. Uh, you know, technical or just design or just anything, just pop it down in there and we'll do our best to answer it. Um, you know, one thing I, I really like about what you're doing is, is uh, combining in live fire and uh, you know, the burger presses and stuff like that, not just building pits. Um, that's something I've never messed with is, is all the cool little things that you need to supplement uh, your builds and stuff. And so what, what kind of got you interested in throwing in on those other items? Uh, mainly just, I mean, we've always cooked on live fire um, at the at deer lease or wherever. It just seems a lot, takes you kind of back to the primal uh, of, of a human being 
to cook with fire. Um, it's just something that's always interested me mm-hmm. and just caught my eye mm-hmm. and we just started rolling with it. Yeah. I, I was looking at your burger presses and there's, they're not just a piece of plate that's cut out with a dang, right. you know, hook on it. I mean, they're nice. They're t- tell me about your process on that. How you, how you, uh, do you forge those or how do you make I don't, them? I, I've got a guy that cuts my blanks out and then I, uh, I straighten one side of the horseshoe and then I make an entry point on the, the, hardwood handle and slip mm-hmm. a brass pin in it it's a it's a tedious process but it, it's mm-hmm. uh it, it's a good look that we like and i think the people are liking it too so yeah that's that's super cool so tell me about how you got the name mule skinner all right so my dad's my dad's been a uh, truck driver my whole life and um his cb handle was mule skinner so that's cool. <laughs> I, I started a page called mule skinner pack rigs which is what my llc is it's these little um overland trailers and stuff so that you could haul and camp and haul luggage and uh it just kind of we packed things so it kind of mule mule skinner that was his name so we just brought it all together and um Mm -hmm. went with it it's a cool name it's a unique name and uh he's proud of it uh yeah he's yeah he's uh he goes with me to all the barbecue events and hangs out with everybody so he's he's getting to hang with some of these people and uh he's actually uh he's got stage four uh, prostate cancer right now. So oh, shoot. the name means more, you know, I'm going to mm-hmm. push this thing nationwide. We've sent presses to Alaska up into the Northeast. Cool. It's, it's, it's getting crazy. And this is something I want to do with him as long as we can. Yeah. That's oh, so He helps you in the shop. He does. He comes from time to time. He sits on the stool and does about like this right here and looks at everything, <laughs> but he's, he's got it figured out. He's the coach. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's, a, he's there behind the scenes. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about the barbecue scene where you're at. You know, I, I, uh, I know I'm right down the street from Ernest's place, uh, burnt bean. I'm, I'm super excited to go check that out, but tell me a little bit about the scene around where you're at. What, who's uh, there and what's happening? Big one. Um, Terry Blacks and deep Ellum in Dallas is one of my favorites. Uh, you got slow bone, which is over off industrial just West of downtown Dallas. Um, we've got a couple of joints here in town, uh, local, uh, nothing big named. Um, we've got, uh, there's lots over in Fort Worth. I'm not too far from Hurtado. Um, he's in Arlington mm-hmm. there. Um, mm-hmm. Let's see. You've got Panther City up there. you got Danes. you got quite a bit in the Metroplex, which is not too far for us to get to. Mm-hmm. That's super cool. Yeah. I, I haven't spent t- enough time around, around there. I mean, it's, it's, I feel like I'm eight hours from everywhere, you know, and I'm right. like eight hours from Dallas too. And, and uh, I need to spend more time there. Of course, I'll be there next weekend at the NBBQA, it's National Barbecue Association Conference. And I'm pretty excited for that. Nice. Um, so what, what, uh, what do you do by day? Tell me a little bit about that. By day, we are in the metal construction industry. I work for DC Metal Construction Incorporated out of Ennis. We uh, started out doing metal buildings, uh, backyard type stuff, uh, got into commercial builds, and now we we are an industrial contractor mainly. We are uh, going to roofing Mm -hmm. plants and all kinds of uh, manufacturing plants and do their maintenance work. We build stairways, catwalks. We, We have a fab shop and everything. Mm-hmm. So, so what do you, uh, so your, your primary focus on your builds, like, tell me a little bit about the kind of smoker you like to build. Um, what kind of, uh, you know, feel you like for that? Like what's, what, what is your, your favorite pit to build? Uh, favorite bit to peel, uh, the pit to build would be the, just the offset smoker. Um, we, we offer a, we'll do the 500s, the 250s. We've quoted some thousands. I've never built one. Uh, we do mm-hmm. quite a few of the uh, backyard units. And then sometimes, oftentimes, we'll get um, just some one-off air tanks or some type of a tank that we'll fabricate one out of just to kind of give it a, a one-off look. And mm-hmm. people tend to like that. But uh, mm-hmm. mainly mainly vintage, maybe raw, mainly raw material. I like to see the patina mm-hmm. on everything. Um, we'll clear coat, we'll linseed oil if it's, uh, you know, bare material, but I just, I like to see Mm -hmm. the character of the tanks. I like to see their story. I like to know where they came from. I like to know what year they were made. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't hide the history. Yeah. I I love it. I love all the multiple colors of paint and whatever comes with it. 
some of them had three, four coats. You get them old oh, yeah. enough, you know, and that kind of breaks up and makes some cool undertones and stuff. I've got, I've got a 43 sitting out here right now, and it's got about that's a good know, one. six shades of gray on it that's all flaked off. So <laughs> I'm ready to get it built that's out. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, hinges and hardware and stuff like that, how do you, what do you like to involve in your builds for that kind of stuff? I, I, I make everything by hand, the hinges, the hinge wise, I use nine sixteenths rod and mm -hmm. I, I bend everything to position, uh, make them all match what I can. Um, I used to hand cut my handle holders. Now I get those made with CNC and, and go with that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I tend to make, I'm very old school. don't have any kind of equipment. Everything's made by hand. Mm -hmm. Cool. So yeah, you just was uh, touching on equipment. I want to come back to that. Um, but like for cooking grates and stuff like that, are you an expanded guy or a rod? Yeah. Expanded guy? metal. Yeah. Yeah. Three quarter yeah. flat expanded metal. Yeah. That seems to be the most popular. I've, I've been toying around with some round bar on some of my builds. And, and uh, I think mostly just because some people like it, it's it's a little easier to clean. But it's right. definitely not cheaper. No, <laughs> it's, no. I've, it's a I've lot had people more reach, money. I've had people reach out to stainless bars. And until I quote that out, they're like, nah, let's just go with the expanded metal. Yeah, we'll just stay with the good old, good old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk about your trailers. I mean, the thing that pops out, I think, to most people, and and uh, actually uh, Bill Perkins here popped it in the chat, um, like everybody digs those white walls and those caps, man. That's that's just super, super cool. Um, what kind of deal is that? I've never used those. Um, like, you can what? find a lot of them at, at Summit. They're, they're an actual race. I mean, not a racing. They're a, uh, they're a trailer tire, load range D, white wall tire. Um, I usually mm -hmm. get my wheels and the baby moons together, which they have to be painted, which lets you do any color you want at that point. Mm -hmm. So what, what's your favorite color on that? I did my first build like a turquoise bluish type thing, but I'm kind of, I actually sold that trailer. So I've got some ideas for a new one. Uh, that's kind of, mm -hmm. I don't want to specifically say the color, but I've got some ideas, but the deep reds, the sure. black, we, just, we did one uh, for Texas made supply company uh, about a month ago. We did just black on it and it, it pops just mm -hmm. as much as any color does. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. You know, uh, I, I just, I noticed back in the day when mill scale was, was starting to use those rims and stuff. And that's when I first noticed them and I was just like blown away. That's just so cool. And, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not the guy to go out and start, you know, riding on the train too quick. You know, I want to let somebody have fun with it and, and kind of figure it out. I just never did go that way. I need to start doing fancy wheels because we've just always <laughs> just done the good old, you know, good old fashioned trailer oh, yeah. wheels. But, um, yeah. you know, so so how do you feel about uh, axle rating as far as trailers go? Like you've built a lot of pack rigs and things like that. Um, like for capacity, uh, say you got a pit that weighs 2000 pounds. What's your recommendation on the, on the axle weight and stuff like that? Well, so on the, on the last 500 I built, I think it weighed in at about 3,500 pounds total. And I had two 50, mm -hmm. I think or 5,500 pound axles under it. So plenty, plenty to carry there. No issue at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I would definitely say over by your weight on your axle just to make sure you're covered. Mm -hmm. Because if you start adding things, boxes live fire anything like that to it over time you're going to want that axle strength yeah absolutely yeah i'm i'm definitely an overkill guy uh we oh, never yeah. could get uh 5500s um you know that we always had to get like 6000 pound axles you know right, right. so by the time we tandem those out it's a 12000 pound trailer yeah. and that's i mean now that's overkill i think in some situations yeah. but yeah. have you built any with double 500s yet not yet. No doubles yet. No, only been not doing yet. singles. No. Yeah. Uh, Tom did one here not long ago. We actually had to counterweight the tongue because <laughs> there's just so, and it was tandems. I mean, you know, right. so it's one of those deals where you can pull the, the tongue jack up and it, and it doesn't move the trailer. Yeah. Just, you'd be off the ground and it's just got so much uh, suspension there. You know, we just we just wanted to get some tongue weight down so it doesn't wag. You know. Well, I've I've um, seen that too with some of the uh, with my firebox. I use a three eighths thick pipe on the back, and it adds so much weight beyond that back axle. Mm -hmm. That's why we tend to try to keep those live fires up front just to keep some front weight on. Yeah, 
and and some wood storage maybe. Yes. Um, yes. I, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I was like, "It's great to build wood storage up there, but if it's used as a counterweight, you got to keep it full of wood. Yeah. yeah. Don't know? burn it all out. Because if <laughs> don't burn it all out, go home yeah. empty and be like get in trouble. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite style of coupler to use? Do you like those ones with the collar, or do you like yeah. the the other kind of A frame? I, I've always liked the A-frame Bulldog cu coupler. Um, they're a bit expensive. Mm -hmm. I found some of that same version, just a little bit cheaper, but I like that style. I don't like the old style pop over, even though yeah. you can pin it. I just, my dad never liked using them. I, I never liked using them. So um, mm -hmm. it just, I just, something about grabbing that, that, that ball on the hitch just means a lot more to me. Yeah. And holding it in place. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So, as far as like building a trailer, like uh, do you do you build it and lay it out and uh, get it all leveled up before you start fabbing anything? I mean, do you uh, how how much work do you put into setup on on building a trailer? On a trailer, I, l I lay out on jacks, uh, my jack stands, get it built, I flip it over, and I'm ready for for tires and wheels at that point. Then I'll level everything mm -hmm. out, get my smoker built where I want it, set it down. But yeah, I don't do a whole lot of, mm -hmm. it doesn't stay in position while I put my smokers on it. I'll roll it out, load my smoker on, bring it back in, get everything situated like I want it. And then I attach it. I don't have a whole lot of yeah. space. I've got about a 25 by 25 shop. That's full of junk on both sides. So I'm able to pull right <laughs> through the middle. I had a, I had a thousand gallon backed in here the other day of a friend's uh, fixing some things on it. I can't build a thousand gallon in that, in that shop. <laughs> I, could get the main, I don't know. If, I could get the main chamber done, but I won't be able to get it on a trailer in there. Yeah. So I, I call that pit builder itis because we start <laughs> accumulating things, you know, right. and, and it's just like, we don't want to let anything go. You know, yeah. I cut little yeah. pipe nipples off and they're threaded on oh. one of them. Like I can't throw that away. I I've might need it one day. Stuff. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's third Especially generation you, for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to keep that stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, tell me about your cooking experience. Uh, like, do you go do competitions or anything? Um, do you Are you gifted with uh, cooking barbecue? I love to cook barbecue. People like it. Um, I don't do competition style. I've never been into that. I've never, I don't even know the process of it. I know there's a, it's a different style of cooking, but we're just traditional backyard briskets, uh, we, we smoked a bunch of turkeys at Thanksgiving, put a post out and had people, if they wanted to bring a turkey by, I threw it on the smoker while I did the others and uh, had a good turnout mm -hmm. for that. Um, we go to, to events. We, we just cooked the come and smoke it event last weekend. We did smash burgers, served 380 of them in two hours. Wow. And uh, so your buddy, Ryan Newland, he was there. Yeah. And that's uh, cool. So, yeah. Uh, so, we, we go to some events. We're going to be down at the uh, Texas Dingers home opener down there in San Antonio, uh, April 23rd, uh, cooking for them. We're building mm -hmm. a pit, a backyard style pit with a uh, live fire attachment to it. And we're going to deliver that and cook for them that day. Mm -hmm. So, so tell us a little bit about your live fire pits. Uh, you know, we talked about stick burners now and like, do you, are they Santa Maria grill style or are they just an open pit? I, like, do you, have yeah, more? I don't, I don't offer a uh, Santa Maria just yet. I've got some interest in it, but there's some things I want to get mechanically right before I, I do that. I want something a little bit more mm -hmm. hidden. I don't want to see all the cables and all that kind of stuff. I want it to be concealed. Um, so what I offer right mm -hmm. now is just a live fire table with a, a, a rack over the top to hang goods or, or whatever you want on it. Mm -hmm. And then the planches and everything, but yeah, everything just on a, just on a tabletop pretty much. Yeah, that's cool. I, I've uh, I, I've yet to start cooking that way. I've never really done a hanging everything kind of cook. I've I've done quite a bit of Santa Marie grill uh, kind of cooks, and and other than that, it's been pretty much just smoking and doing burgers and of course steaks and stuff. But um, yeah, there's I'm some really other styles. To start getting into that. Yeah, there's some mm -hmm. other styles I want to get into with some of the hanging baskets for chicken and different type things that I don't know about. It's just going to take doing it. But that that kind of stuff mm -hmm. interests me. Like I said, like I said before, the primal type cooking, just heat on some meat and and get it done. Yeah, let's see. We got a. Uh, OK, this guy's just saying he's he's enjoying the interviews. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank Good you, deal. Chuck. Um. You know, so uh, let's let's talk, guys. If you have any questions, technically about what you'd like to hear, uh, get them up here in the chat, and we'll be covering those here directly. 
Um, tell me a little bit about your your favorite way to finish. I mean, you said something about clear coat. Do you use uh, linseed oil or any alternatives? Um, how I, much I do. prep do you put into it? The linseed oil, yeah, I just warm everything up to 350 to 400 and I apply it with a rag. Um, I've done some clear coating type stuff. Um, KBS makes a product uh, for clear coat, but I've even like mm-hmm. on the small backyard units, I'll just buy a 2000 degree Rust Oleum in a rattle can mm-hmm. and, and apply that. And it's, it yeah. gives it a really good look too. Mm-hmm. So, do you like more of a gloss or a satin? You think? I like to see the I like to see the gloss because it'll it's going to dull out anyway a little bit as you start mm-hmm. using it once it once it cooks in. But I, I like to see a little mm-hmm. bit of the gloss. It kind of makes everything pop real well, especially if it's That's got cool. a meal scale to your plate and you're not using the the pickled and oil finish. It it really gives it a good mm-hmm. look. Oh yeah, for sure. So, do you leave the paint on the tank or you knock it off? You think? I'll scrape if it's got flakes on it. Yeah, I'm going to scrape it off, but I'm not going to sit there and and rip every bit of that down and take it down to material. No, yeah, <laughs> man, I I feel I feel sorry for some of those guys, man. I mean, because they get them down and polish them, you know. I mean, Moberg Mo uh, puts a finish on his, buddy. He does. You know, he he, he uh, takes it down. <clears throat> Yeah, Tom just did one like that too for for a guy in Korea. He's building a pit that's going out to a uh, barbecue guy in Korea and a thousand gallon. And uh, man, it took him a few days. It's <laughs> it's a freaking lot of work. And I mean, you could throw as much mechanical and stuff at it as you want, um, but it, it's it's a job to get an old tank down. Um, what about like Sonny. bones? Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, I, said, I, I had messaged Sonny one day. They were polishing. I said, man, you must go through the Tiger disc. He said, yeah, about 20 a day. <laughs> 20 a day. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, well, I seen him haul in a load of 500s here a while back that was all uh, just – they was all clean. They was like salvage looked like. Oh, yeah. So uh-huh. That's pretty cool. Sam Blassen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, as far as like um, – what was the other question I had just a second ago? I was going to ask you about bungs. Um, are you uh, cutting bungs out on the tanks or do you leave I'm, them in? I'm, yeah, I'm capping. I'm just capping everything capping. off. Yeah. Yeah, we, we yeah. started doing that too. Um, and I'll tell you why is because we actually had some some cookers with bigger doors and one door. You know, we did a cooker that was essentially one door. We call it split overlap. So one door's got to open oh, yeah, yeah. the other does. Yes. And yeah. we cut those bungs out and that whole tank, I couldn't believe it. The tank twisted. It's yeah. the craziest thing I ever saw. And so we was just like, nope, we just going to make a nice little cap on there. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah. the one I just did for Texas Made has a, I don't know, it's probably an eight inch round on top. They had welded some kind of a neck on that tank. And I just capped the entire thing. I said, well, here you go. Here's a tortilla warmer or coffee warmer. There you go. Whatever. So we capped it and rolled with it. Mm -hmm, For sure. So uh, let's see here. Yeah, here's a shout out for Chuck. Iron Oak Barbecue Pits. I tell you what, you got to check out his stuff. Um, Oh, he's up in Vegas. Really, really cool work. Yeah, yeah. He he does a lot of uh, fire pits and stuff. And, man, they just – they're the berries. I love it. Um, Oh, he's got a unique look. Yeah, Richard here has got a question. Have you ever bent square tubing or like radius, like rolled the corner? You ever uh, done anything like that? As far as arching some tubing, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got a buddy that's got a roller. We built one actually one time, but it doesn't do very good with tubing. It, it just mainly does plate. Now, I've done some mm-hmm. real small, like three-quarter or half-inch just by hand. Just put it in, a, in, in two pieces of pipe or whatever. Just kind of work the radius you want, but... Uh, tubing tends to roll over as you as you make your radius yeah yeah um i was talking to a friend of mine up up the road here 100 miles or so and and, uh, from rolla there and uh, he makes a lot of fire kettles is what he makes uh john pinnell and and he rolls tubing to go around for the footrest on there and he uses a halsfeld bender um but he's got like the legit one you know we we can right. see those ones at harbor freight you know yeah. or uh yeah. uh you know grizzly or whatever but uh, this one here is like a legit old Hallsfeld bender. And, uh, cool. man, he can make that just look perfect. I've never seen anything like it. But it's almost so like you got to crush the walls a little bit, do. the side walls. You, yeah. You kind of got to crush the, or, bottom, the bottom portion of the tube to let it, to let it uh, rest, let it go inside the mm-hmm. other tube and as it rolls around. 
Now, any of my yeah. any of my flat bars, like two inch flat or anything that I've made round pits for, like in the past, like the cowboy cookers, that's all by hand mm-hmm. for me. Um, I just take mm-hmm. I have a little jig with two pieces of pipe coming out, and I just sit there and work it by eyeball until I get it to the radius I want. And I've done that. Mm-hmm. I've done that hundreds of times. I mean, we we build ladders at work that have cages around them, the OSHA cages, and we I yeah. rolled every one of those by hand. Uh, we recently started getting them made, but some of those early ones, we mm-hmm. rolled everything by hand. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's definitely a skill. Um, like uh, angle iron, too. You know, I was uh, yeah. talking to John, and he actually makes some angle iron that he'll trim out. It's, it's just he puts the leg out. You know, mm-hmm. I always yeah. get my hand screwed up. He puts the leg out on the roll and rings it. And he, I right. think he's using one of those Hallsfeld benders with a, with a uh, like some kind of a adapter or something in there you know they i never i didn't have enough time to really dive into it but that's that's something that i yeah yeah and it and especially if you can make both ends match and not roll like you're talking about you know that's even better (laughs) there's a there's a custom Uh, shop out of dallas that's rolled some for us in the past to do a tank radius like a big 16 foot radius or wide tank mm -hmm. and they'll roll that three inch or four inch by quarter angle around there for us to weld it to it and that's it. Mm-hmm. That's custom work right there. That's that's hard to do. Oh, for sure, for sure. So so yeah. On the uh, for, I was going to ask about thermometers. What is your opinion on thermometers? Like for big dials, mm-hmm. long probes, you know, placement things like that. We always get a lot of questions about that. Um, I tend to buy the four inch Teltrus. Um, mm-hmm. I put some two inch on a build recently. Um. Placement, I think you can get too many of them. I think you can get too, too many across there and everybody expects them all to be exactly the same. And it's it's almost impossible. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've, I've started pulling away on our backyards. I just give them one dead center of the door and that's it because that's all you need. You need your average across that yeah. thing, in my opinion. Um, but yeah. tell, trues, tell trues who I lean on for those. Um I like the product. I like that they thread into a half inch OLED or half coupling and, and they, they work well. Um, Mm -hmm. I I can see, I can see the need for an upper if you want it, you know, in your upper rack to get your ribs and things in. But I think across the bottom, I think you're good. You know, if you keep your eye on your meat, but the, the guy I work for daily never uses a thermometer in his smoker never has. Yeah. And, uh, he just has a feel for it. Yeah. It just, they yeah. just have a feel for it, and I'm more comfortable kind of mm-hmm. seeing where I'm at, uh, you know, through the cook. We did, uh, mm-hmm. we did six, or we did 20 briskets uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, it was on a mill scale 1,000, and and it was even across the bottom, didn't have to move anything, but it, it's, mm-hmm. I just like to know where I'm at through the cook. I, I don't think I could mentally not have a thermometer on that thing anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I agree with you. Mi- minimize the amount of information that, that they're having to figure out, you know? Right. And right. Uh, uh, I, on some pits, like if, if I've never, like if it's a new design, like I'm using a different kind of baffle or I'm wanting to jack around with my design and figure out like some new theory or something like that, I'll go digital and I'll stick some probes right. in there about four different spots, you know, and then compare that to the door. Man, you'll be shocked sometimes. You'll get totally different readings. Oh, what's I going know. on? But but at least if you have a reference mark and turn like yeah. ignore the number, just turn it to where the dial's straight up where you right. like it. Yeah. Then they're all in tune. <laughs> right, right. Well, and if yeah. if you'll you ever mess with them, people that have touched and felt those, if you ever push the stem a little bit, the, the gauge moves. Mm-hmm. So if there's mm-hmm. any defect at all anywhere, you're going to get false reading somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's a question here. Uh, Sieg's Small Batch Barbecue. Uh, what do you find is the most important design factor and where do you come up with your volume figures? Some guys are and some guys aren't. <laughs> what I, do you think, Dustin? I'm not. It's all feel. It's how much air I think needs to go through that thing. I've tried to plug some things into the uh, Feltman's calculator or whatever it is, yep. and I'm well over what they say I need. But I've got my little 250 doesn't draw like I think it should. But the the last 500 I did, I could pull a log out four or six inches out, and it pulled everything back in. So 
Yeah. It's a feel thing for me because it takes getting, no matter how you build that unit, once you start using it mm -hmm. and get your feel for it, how you want the damper on the stack, how you want your, your back baffle or your door opened, it's all part of the process to figure out where you need to be when you're cooking. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about your discovery process on where you came up with, you just decided to do it that way. Um, Cause you mentioned Feldman's. I, I, I'm just curious how many hours you spent trying to, trying to knuckle through some calculations and then one day just how you chose. I, I didn't, <laughs> I, I plugged it in after okay. the fact just to see if I was cleared. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. I, That's I, cool. I, yeah. I didn't spend a lot of time on there. I came across that one day or some of these forums, I see people trying to use mm -hmm. that, that calculator and, the square inches that I was probably double what I needed to go into that 250. And, mm -hmm. but it's, it's all, like I say, it's all for the feel that you want, that you want there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it's so interesting to me about, you know, there, I always say there's no wrong way to do it. It's just the way that works for you and the way that works for your customers, honestly. Um, and, uh, I, I like the different styles and stuff like that. For instance, uh, I'm, I have a plan right now that we're drawing that it's, it's normally with our plans. Like we, we stick very close to our rules that we've come up with for the beginning, you know, and, uh, we're breaking all the rules on this one. Well, the last one, we just broke all the rules. We did fully, it's not published yet, but it's completely and absolutely fully insulated cook chamber and all. It's rectangle. Oh, it's too. got, yeah, rectangle. It's. I mean, I'm expecting problems, <laughs> but <laughs> the guy wants it that way, and so I got you. We're just so we're starting to get there now. You know, like yeah, yeah. let's put the half of two fifty on a on a thousand gallon tank and see what happens. You know, right, right. Guys are building them that way and selling them for money, and people are cooking yeah. on them. So. Yeah. It's yep. not a matter of right or wrong. It's a matter of how is it working. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, right. You and know. it's worked the way how, you how, want it to work. Yeah. How do you feel about a 250 using that for a 1,000 gallon? I, I know that you said you haven't built a 1,000 yet, but you ran a mill scale. And I don't yeah. know. I think they use a half a 250. It is. Yeah, it's a half a 250 mm -hmm. there with a liner on the inside uh, pipe. And it tends to work mm -hmm. good. I don't know how some of them, I believe, use the 250 as what holds the wood it's not doesn't have the liner inside of that um mm -hmm. but the the 250 the length of it everything because some people are front box some are back um you mm -hmm. got a lot of room you got well that's a seven foot tank so you got three foot six there to uh to play mm -hmm. with the depth of your fire and i think it's a really good number yeah yeah i think i think there is something to that um you know even just using the door as the air inlet you know right. like like sunny and some of those guys do uh we did one pit that way and it worked great um i, I loved it you know um so i'm gonna have to play around with that a little bit here here's my here's my buddy kevin he just came through our welding school there um oh. he says he saw my radius uh ruler that i use for plasma guide uh what's your favorite homemade pit fab tool dustin Oh, <laughs> we all got, got something. <laughs> yeah, I've got straight edges with with uh, levels clamped to it with a, another straight bar to get my, my center lines. Um, favorite thing I've got right now is a Dewalt laser that shoots me a laser line once I've got my tank leveled up. That That's my favorite. Yeah. But as far as homemade, I've got countless jigs hanging on the wall and, and, and in that shop that I use for different things. Uh, my hinges are mm -hmm. a piece of um uh, 035 welding wire in the shape that i want and that's what i mock every one of them off of i mean oh it, that's cool yeah. yeah i mean it's i've got all kinds of homemade stuff out there yeah yeah you know we uh we we never used a laser level i don't know why uh, I, we just never did a cross laser level by the way is is amazing but oh yeah we, we did a lot option. of things you know the hard way and yeah. uh then one day Tom brought that thing in and said, by God, let's do it this way. And man, it, once you get it leveled up and, and you get that tank, that cook chamber level, and then you yeah. can set the firebox pitch off of that laser level. My goodness, it's game on at that point, especially yeah. with round fireboxes. I don't know how you would ever get everything to line up without it. You know, right. Um, right. You can't use a string line. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I mean, maybe you could, but. I don't uh, know. There's a so yeah, yeah that ruler with some of the some of the tanks. If they've modified any of the bung holes or anything on the top, you'll get a dip in it. So you've got to be sure to yep. measure. I mean, level end to end there at the caps at the heads. Um, yeah, I had a small. Well, yep. 
I had a small little boiler tank. It was only 16 inch diameter, but I made my, I made it upside down. I had my firebox mounted to the chamber. Well, I'm leveling everything here, mm -hmm. and I flip it over, and it looks like my firebox is running uphill toward the back, <laughs> and it, because it was out of yeah. shape a little bit, you know. So always look at your top side. Yep, your top side, and then Tom and I always said too. We always told the guys in the shop. We said level it, you know, square it, level it, the whole bit. Stand back and look at it, and go with your eye. <laughs> yes, oh, I, <laughs> because some, definitely... sometimes, yeah, like I've seen them. I've seen a firebox look crooked, and yes. you set it yeah. on. You set it to a line, a chalk line, anything you want, and it's straight, but it looks crooked. You know, no, so we always, just wind up always. I always look at those eyes. I'll do that with grading. I won't level up all four corners. If I'm not on a table, if I'm on jack stands, I just squat down and look across because if you've got two lining up, the other two are going to line up with it. And I, I do a lot of that yep. stuff by eye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This guy right here, man, Ron Hardy, big, huge shout out to Ron. He's a cool dude. Um, he built a gravity feed years ago. Um, and his son's Cole Sweet. He up out of St. Louis, but He's asking what gauge tubing you guys use for bending. So you were talking earlier, I think, about uh, smaller tubing, but yeah. is it what wall thickness? Yeah, your 14 mm -hmm. gauge, 16 gauge, somewhere in there. Yeah, I wouldn't try to roll. One eighth's going to try to crinkle up on. You might could do one eighth, but anything heavier than that's going to start bending sharp. It's not going to have any kind of a round to it. And when I say bend it, I'm talking mm -hmm. slightly bend it and work your way until it starts to round out. But like I said earlier, yeah. too, you have to yeah. be careful with it trying to roll out on you. Mm hmm. Yeah, and you can also, I, uh, that's something I need to mess with. I've mm -hmm. seen guys take Go and ahead. slice it. They'll slice it like every one inch or or half inch just on three sides of the tubing, roll it to the radius you want, weld all those seams back, grind it down. It kind of gives you the same look if you're going pretty tight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, here's another little pit builder shout out. I got two of them to do. Adam York. What's up, buddy? I'm so glad to see that you're back in the game, bro. Oh, yeah, for um, sure. Took a little hiatus there for a little bit. Yeah. Keep it up. And uh, another one here, Red Devil. Got to give him a shout out. Good to oh, see yeah. you guys been, on here. He's got good stuff too. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We got another question here. Let's see what we got here. Holiday Lawrence, does it matter which side the firebox is mounted? Typically see on the right side. How do you feel? Like right side, left side? Is there a better best? Is there a reason? I just had this conversation with a buddy just a couple of days ago. I'm I'm right-handed, so I want to see it on the right. I want to work it to the right. Uh, Matt Leon with with Smoke Game Strong, I just built his backyard. He's left-handed. He wanted to see the box on the left. It doesn't matter which way you do it. It's just all how you want it to look. Uh, most of your pits mm -hmm. are going to be driver's side on a trailer, but you'll get mm -hmm. them from time to time that want it over on the passenger side. Yeah, like for street fairs or something. Yeah, for or sure. If, yeah. if for some reason they got to be on the sidewalk, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I say the same thing. And then a lot of times, though, you'll have a lefty and a righty if you're in a pit room or something and you want the guy right. to be able to turn around or for something sure. like that. Um, but as far as, like, operationally, I don't think it matters at all. It um, it's just a matter of personal preference. Yeah. Right. If you got a heavy wind coming out the, the opposite direction of your box, you know, you always tend to want to kind of flip that around anyway. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We think about all these questions. I love it when they start hammering them in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun just to get different perspectives. You've got me out of my comfort box here, Frank. <laughs> Do I really? <laughs> That's fun, though. Let's see. Here's another one here. Question for both of you on a traditional 250 offset. If you're using tuning plates, how far under the cooking grate do you run them? I've always said three inches or so is fine, four inches. But I think what Bill's asking is, like, if you have a rail under the cooking grates for an old school offset, like what uh, David Close and them used to build or whoever it was, they put six inch and eight inch plates with gaps in between them. Um, that's what I do. What do you think? That kind of that tends to make it a reverse flow, right, at some point? Well, the, uh, they, the stack is still on the across. offset. I got you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Bigger gaps yeah, not, as you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Um, I, I get mm -hmm. several people, too, wanting to know if I build reverse flow, but I, I've never built one. I'm not comfortable doing it, so I stick to the traditional offset uh, without any kind of plates in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I definitely, over time, I've started to uh, 
go back to open offset. Um, I've got a pit project I'm working on kind of in the, in the background. It's, it's a production style pit. And um, I was going to involve both a uh, vertical baffle, like we always talk about. And uh, like, I, I make everything go up as fast as I can as soon mm. as it comes out the throat or I'll use those tuning plates, but I'll be honest with you. I'm nixing both of those. I'm, I'm just gotcha. going to make it wide open and, right. and uh, just letting it be wide open and let it cook. I mean, you'll get another completely different product. And uh, you know, we threw down on a brisket. My buddy Aaron and I did this last weekend at the school there and it was just on point, man. Butcher I paper. Saw, I'm I not a butcher paper brisket. guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not a butcher paper guy. I never could pull it off, but you know, he, we took the brisket trimmings, we cut it all up in the little tiny pieces, which that's something I was doing wrong is I was putting the whole brisket fat in. You got to cut it up and rendered the fat into tallow, did the whole bit, dude, dynamite. I'm so proud of that. It was good. So we, brisket. we had a benefit from my dad just a month or so ago. And when we cooked those big, those 20 briskets, well, some of them that were donated were super trim. So we we took and sliced the fat like normal, like we're doing, trimming them up. We laid that on those super trim briskets that had no covering on them and did that. But we grinded up a ton of it and made tallow out of it. Same way. That's mm. the first time I'd done that. That's an interesting process. Yeah, don't burn it, I guess. I, I didn't know right. you could burn the, the fat like we cooked it a little bit too long. It, yeah. it didn't get a bad smell. I think it just gets an off smell. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, googly moogly. One day I need to know his real name. He's all over my stuff <laughs> on his, on the YouTube here. I appreciate you, brother. You, <laughs> you said, uh, build some out of air tanks. How thick are they? Do people complain about them being thin? We have two air tanks, two one twenties, right? They're two, they're not quarter. Um, uh, what are you, what is your experience with air tanks? Uh, most of them I've done have, have are three sixteenths. You will get some, uh, you'll get some spring in the door for sure on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got, a, I'll take uh, little turn buckles and I'll pull them in, get them like set, like I want, get my bars in, pull them off. But I, I like them. Um, I, I don't mm -hmm. know how long they'll last. You know, they've got to last 10, 20 years, I'm sure. But yeah, they're sure. definitely going to be, they're definitely going to be thinner. Now there's some, some people will bring me a tank and they might be a, a Campbell Hallsfield or some kind of a Walmart type, air tank and they're they're less than three sixteenths they're one eighth that's those are mm -hmm. made for air they're yeah i wouldn't use those tanks for anything else yeah I, i've actually cut into it the last couple 120 gallon propane tanks i did were thinner than quarter thinner than three oh, really? sixteenths yeah um, yeah I, it seems like they were more like 10 gauge not 12 um right. they they were right at or a little more than an eighth but uh um they they were thin and you're right them doors spring like, yeah. like the dick is, and as far you know. as far as uh if he's interested in building one be careful where you're welding you know skip around mm -hmm. don't don't weld in one one area too long to try to avoid some of that warping yeah stop on a start that's what bob told yeah. me uh, and yeah. once he told me that it was totally different game when as <laughs> yeah. much as you can anyway when you're skipping around yeah stop right. your bead on a start um any winners show up Actually, he's asking about the $4,000 giveaway I did with the welder and everything. And uh, yes, there's the second place winner has not claimed, but the first and the third did claim. So um, by the way, the only way that you know, is you got to go to your email and you got to check your email and look in your spam folder too. Um, sometimes it'll be in there. If you're watching, um, we usually let it go for a couple of three weeks. And if the prizes aren't claimed, then we'll rehash them for the next giveaway. So um, but yeah, uh, Shane Mink actually won first place and he's got a whole lot of stuff coming to him. So let's see, Dave Taylor, what you got there, bro? Uh, I'm considering changing careers from mechanical design to pit builder. Any words of wisdom for, for a newbie? What do you think, Dustin, about the transition period? You're not really there full time yet, but kind of go into it all. He's uh he's got if the mechanical want. background. He should be able to uh, get him some pits built for sure. Mm hmm. Yeah, I would say. I, I would say. Go ahead. No, I, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. I, I was just gonna say I would take it easy and I I would go slow into it. And like Green Money Fab said on his episode, he said, "Don't over tool." Um, you know, if if you're willing to start to start the process, 
Uh, one way you can do is make sure you get your money right first if you're serious about going full time. Um, if you're going to make the transition, if the, the, the reason most businesses fail is not because of money, it's because they didn't build enough pits fast enough at prices high enough and that kind of thing. And what winds up happening is, is if you don't start out early, it's not the money you have when you get started. It's the money you have throughout the process of building those first 10 pits. And if you don't capitalize properly during that process, you'll wind up, you know, having a, it won't be fun. No, always be working hard and scared of the money. <laughs> so uh, anyway, but uh, any thoughts on that part of it, Dustin? I would definitely say, take it slow. Um, use what you got. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, don't, don't get a bunch of stuff to don't overthink it. Just get you some simple builds out and uh, go from there. Yeah. I, I don't really think that you should go full time until you've got 10 builds under your belt in one year. I, I just kind of been thinking about that a lot. I mean, because the amount of energy to do 10 builds in one year, I mean, that's a, that's a high commitment level. That's a high level of work to, to be able to hold down a full time job, especially if you're a fabricator like yourself, Dustin, you know, you're, you're burning a lot of hours and yeah. there's overtime more than likely, you know, um, until you can pull off those 10 builds, you know, and do them at, at, you know, a, a reasonable rate, not cheap, you know, don't right. do them cheap. Uh, yeah. cause you're shooting yourself in the foot. What about pit pricing? I mean, we never talk about that. I mean, how do you feel about pit pricing? Do you feel like, you know, we, we always used to say back in the day before steel went nuts, we always said $3 a pound is what we would say for your retail price. Do you have any kind of like rule of thumb? You don't have to reveal the hard stuff, but like, you know, I, what do you I'm think? always, I do it in my regular job. When we quote jobs, I try to think about how long it's going to take me to do something and how much do you want per mm -hmm. hour? You know, I, I try to break it down into that time. Are you going to have somebody helping you? Um, you know, I, I try to break it down in that. I don't really go by prices. Now, I have my prices now that I know how long it takes to do something. Um, but mm -hmm. I've always tend to break it down per hour um, and how quick I want to do it. Yeah, it's it's definitely a matter of making sense out of how much money you need in order to justify doing it, you know to, to get your goals and your dreams hit for sure. Um, I'm going to show this one here real quick. Uh, wait, it says Wazy, I think I got my glasses off. Um, how do you calculate your throat size? Well, I cheat and use a calculator is how I do it. I use bbqpitcalculator.com, but also there's Feldens as well. Um, and we're both pretty close on that number. Um, what do you do though on your, on your end of it, Dustin? I, I don't have anything scientific at all. Um, I kind of get a feel for it. Usually I, I'll leave me a lip on the bottom of my tank to make sure I get no grease going back into my fire pit. And then yep. normally I'll, I'll look at kind of hot, kind of the same deal, get back and look at it. You know, uh, it's just some mm -hmm. of it's trial and error for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, uh, this next one here from Richard, I think we're both probably going to say the same thing. He's asking about the rusty man. They're, pounding us with questions. I love it. Uh, the, the head of the tank, like if there's a whole bunch of divots in it, do you spot weld them and stuff? Do you fill no. all that in or do you just let nature show? Let it show. Uh, I, I keep bringing up Texas made yeah. because it's one of the best patinaed ones I've, I've got. And it's got a huge dent in the side of it. So he just says a, a meteor hit it. So that's, that's all you got to do. I didn't even cover it up. You <laughs> that's know, a story. I, yeah. That's yeah. A, that's a yeah. conversation starter. <laughs> <laughs> yep yep let the story show i like that a lot um here we go ken reitzma was the third prize winner there he got uh he didn't get the welder but he got a freaking nice hood and a whole bunch of blue demon gear congrats there ken nice. appreciate you he's he's got a ticket to the welding class too um boom tick tick how you doing bro good to see you on here um yeah, googly moogly here. He's back again. Let's see what he's got to say. He says, I'm scared to overcharge people. I like the confidence to tell people my work is worth thousands of dollars. Actually, what I recommend on that, I'll just throw mine in here, is, is don't talk about don't talk about price. Talk about value first. Um, you know, every one of these pits is very unique. They can't just go down the store to buy them. You know, your work in particular is very unique. So 
my vote is is sell it based on the value and the experience that you can give your customer. Let them figure out the price later. They either they either are serious or they're not. You know, what do right. you think, Dustin? Yeah, and I don't know if, if this guy's a pit builder or a welder at all, but it, it, there's comes a time where you don't need it for practice anymore. You're trying to make a living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the, the thing is, is that uh, as scarce as it is, I mean, I don't know how far you're backed out, um, but the industry, you know, normal is more than six months. Typically, yeah. if you're full time, closer to two years, as scarce it is, as it is to even get a pit, you know, the, they're they're button ahead of line if you're going to build a one right if you have it in the next three months, it's worth it every penny you would charge. Yeah, in my for opinion. sure. Um, yeah, someone will pay it, especially you know like like I don't think there should be a pit built for you know less than nine eight nine thousand dollars. I I think they all should be higher than that right now, just because of the price of steel. You know the yeah. amount of stuff we all got going on, things like that. I know for a thousand gallon, we're you know between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars right now, right. just depending yeah. on the complexity of it. So there's no sense in leaving money on the table unless you're just doing it for fun, you know, which is fun making money. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I sure like to have money. So yeah, you got to um, enjoy what you do too. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we're still getting hammered with questions here, but I want to talk to you a little Bring bit them. more. Right. So, so, uh, anyway, so how long have you been in the barbecue on the barbecue scene? Like as far as uh, cooking and stuff like that? I mean, we've always cooked all over the years, but just since, since May, really last May, I've been kind of mm -hmm. in this industry. I've met tons of people. Um, this is one of the most tight knit communities I've ever been in. And um, they all take care of each other. It's it's not like when you go anywhere. This is not this is not my competitor. This is my buddy. You know, it's yeah. everybody's friendly. Everybody's in the same game. Um, it's like old Cooper Abercrombie told me one time: the pie is so big, everybody can have a slice. It's not you're not. Yeah. There's so so much. I mean, I have I probably have 25 to 30 quotes right now that need to go out. It, it's there's so many people involved with barbecue it's it's unreal mm -hmm. yeah there's definitely no shortage of customers out there right um you know like i mean i was even talking about buying some burger presses from you you know because yeah. it's it's not just it's not just a smoker and getting the best deal anymore it's it's who built it right you know like one a guy's gonna go out and buy a pit from this guy and then a couple years later he's gonna go out and buy another pit from another guy and, and it's, it's a, it's a collection now it's, it's yeah. gone to that, you know, it's right. not, we're not just satisfying the need for a smoker. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, 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 the competitive nature of getting someone, it's like barbecue rub. I tell the barbecue rub guys this all the time. Do you, I am, I have got chicken fried in my cabinet. I got Oak Ridge in my cabinet. I got, you know, you name them TDs. I got, you know, sweet swine of mine. I got a lot of brands in my cabinet. Malcolm Reed's in there. You know, all these different guys are in my cabinet at home and I uh, wouldn't have it any other way. And it's kind of getting to be the same way with, with smokers, I think, yeah. um, you know, so. I know lots of people different with several different, as well. right. I know lots mm -hmm. of them that have several different kinds, you know, John down in Inter mm -hmm. Interstellar has got a mill scale. He's got a Moberg. He's got one that a friend of his built. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. a collector, you know, uh, yeah. and, you know, you brought up it's the, the burger presses. Yeah, you brought up the burger presses again. So another community that is brought into us here is is the Blackstone guys, the guys that are cooking on their their Blackstone yeah. on their back porch. They're you know mm -hmm. some of the top buyers of this thing. So that kind of Man, ties I'm, the I'm really stick having... burners to the to the to the flat top guys, and even some of the Traeger guys. You know. Yep. Yep. I'm, I'm really having a hard time because I want to buy a Blackstone, like something bad, but see, the deal is, is that I, I build that stuff. So it's like, I'm really having right. a hard time yeah. justifying purchasing a Blackstone when yeah. I could just build me a coal fired one or something, you know, or well, and something you, you like came that. From the same, <laughs> you know, like my dad, and when we were growing up, if you needed something, you built it, you know, you didn't just go yeah. out and buy it. So yeah. that's kind of how I've always been. My yeah. wife and I first got married. I built our furniture. I built our entertainment center. I mean, you just, you built it. You didn't buy it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's something, man. 
Well, I tell you what, Dustin, I'm super glad that you joined me here on this deal tonight. And, uh, you know, I hate to cut it short. Um, I am at a conference and I got to get back downstairs. But I I'll tell you what, give the guys an, some information here. This is going to be on our YouTube channel, uh, you know, forever. So uh, give them an in, some information about how to get a hold of you, like your website and, uh, okay. you know, your Instagram handle and stuff. All right. You can uh, you mm-hmm. can find us on the Web at uh, MuleSkinnerSmokeRigs.com. Uh, we're also on Instagram at Mule Skinner Smoke Rigs. Uh, look us up on Facebook, TikTok. Uh, what else are we mm-hmm. on? I think that's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, you're down in one more time where you're located, and, and where do you ship if you build a pit? Where, where who can get it? Uh, we've got quote. I've got one going to oh. Montana. You there? I've got one going to uh, Montana. Yeah, yeah, we're so- here. Yeah, I've got a guy that's coming out of California that does hot shot rigs that's going to come pick it up and and take it. Um, and I usually I usually leave that to the customers to get it shipped or if they want to come pick it up or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I would say the lower 58 here would be plenty good. Yeah, that's cool. Right on, fellas. Well, I tell you what, I'm excited for the next one as well. I've got a buddy of mine lined up to talk about paint. I don't know how you guys all feel about that, but to, <laughs> tune in next week. This guy's a pro. Paint, powder coat, the whole bit. So, Dustin, I appreciate you being on the show, and I uh, can't wait to see what comes out of your shop next, bro. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And Thank you, Frank, for all that you do for this whole community too, buddy. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. We'll see you guys. Have a great weekend. All right. See you.